Dear God, I just want to thank you so much for who you are, Lord. And I just pray as, Lord, I just pray for these eighth graders as we um, come to the end of a season. Lord, would you continue to work in their lives? Um, Lord, would you continue to keep them connected to you and to Christians, Lord? Um, and hopefully it's here at North Coast. Lord, we just pray as we um, kind of end this Even If series, Lord, would you, um, Lord, just speak through me. And if there's something that these students can learn from, from today, Lord, that'd be awesome. We love you in your name. Amen. Um, when I was younger, I know it's, it's I, I, was, I went to Awanas. How many of you guys went to Awanas, has ever gone to Awanas? How many have ever heard of Awanas before? Okay, so the few of you have. Now, Awanas would have been like my church's like youth group, but it was also for like elementary students. Um, and it was focused on Bible memory, all right? And they hooked me because I was competitive, okay? So even just if you could memorize verses, more verses than other people, you could win. Just that competitive, they got me. Like, they, they tricked me. I learned a lot of verses because of competitiveness. And because of my competitiveness, I also loved Awan Olympics, you see, Awana, somehow, they came up with their own design of a court that had their own games. And I don't know why. It was probably, again, my competitive nature, probably also my sheltered nature. Uh, didn't really get out there a lot, but I loved Awanas. And I loved Awana Olympics, okay? And our church happened to be pretty legit at it. And if you made it on our church's Awana Olympic team, there was a good chance you were getting gold this year. Now, I loved it so much that you don't understand. I was different. I so badly wanted to win, so badly, that it's probably the only kid in the United States that I would actually practice for the Iwan Olympics in the offseason, okay? It's just some stupid Olympics, but I took it seriously, okay? That was me. I wanted to win so bad. Um, I am known, it's bad, but my brother and I have a twin brother. We would do the three-legged race in the Iwan Olympics. And there, there's like 10 events. One of them was the Iwan Olympics. I mean, was the three-legged race. And I would make my brother practice like in the summer. We would run around the block with a three-legged race tie on. Okay? Imagine two nine-year-olds running around the block in a three-legged race tied together. People were probably like, who are those kids? Yeah, that's right. I set records, okay? That's why I did it. Um, but I loved the Iwan Olympics. And honestly, my sixth grade year, I, you know, if you're the best athlete on your team, you get to do six events. Yes, heck yeah, I was in six events. And my goal was to win every single one of those events. And it was my sixth grade year. It was the pinnacle. Like we had never lost. But I did not want to only win. I wanted to dominate. Okay. I wanted to set records. And so we had this one relay where the first person would run like one lap, the next person would run three laps, the next person would run five laps, and the last person would run six. I don't know. It was like where your laps would go, the last person, and I was the last person. I was the final. And in the Iwana Olympics, you run around in a circle, but there's these, um, uh, what did I call them? They're not cones, but th um, never mind, pins. There we go. They're called pins. And so you would run around the pin, and then you would go to the middle of the circle, and there'd be a pin on top of a beanbag, and if you could get to that pin first, you won that race, okay? It's a big deal. So, we're doing the relay. We're dominating the relay. We are winning, and I'm the last person, and I'm thinking, we're going to break the record so bad that my name will be etched in hitch history for a one Olympics forever kind of thing, right? So, we're getting ready. We had practiced this handoff for, for months, and I'm going to do this handoff, and we're going like this. And right when I go to grab the baton, a kid runs through our hands, and the baton goes throwing, goes fl flying and fl flinging, whatever, outside of the square even. And in my mind, I'm thinking, no, no, we're going to lose. I, I can't lose. So I run out. I'm grabbing it now. Students are running, and I just was like, no, and I just start booking for my six laps, and I'm, I'm catching people, and I remember I come around the pin at the end, and I come around the pin, another guy came around the pin, and we're going for that center pin, and I leap in the air, and I grab the pin right before him and just fall on my side and just like scrape everything, and I just remember I'm laying on the ground going, who's the man, okay, who's the man, all right, 
I just got up. Everyone's like, dang, Trav, that was legit. We did not set the record because that stupid pin flying, you know, the baton flying, but we won. That was the point. But here's the thing is, I wanted to win so bad that it was a huge part of my life. It absorbed me for like, it was, it was a big deal. And, and this is a crazy intro, um, a crazy transition, but I want to talk about something else that we're going to talk about in Philippians as we continue this Even If series that is something that the world is longing for. The world wants really badly. If you live in this world, you're longing for this. People are going, I want that. Just as bad as I want to win, people want this. And you're going to discover the world's never going to get it. But the thing is, if we're Christians, we already have it. So if you have your Bibles, open up Philippians chapter 4. Verse, we're going to start with two, but really I want to get to, to verses 6, 7, 8, 9, but we're, we're doing through the chapter chapter 4, so, so bear with me, and I'm telling you right now, I don't know how to say these names. I don't know why God put them in there, but he did. Okay, so we're just going to read through this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2. If you were not aware, Philippians was written by Paul. He is in prison right now. He is writing this, being chained to a guard 24-7. And this is what his last chapter in Philippians is what he starts with. He says this, I plead with, oh, crud, Yodia, I, with E, Lady E, Okay. I pleaded with Lady E, excuse me, and I pleaded with Lady S, because I don't know how to say that name either, to agree with each other. Please agree with each other, girls, in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal, why is there a word called yoke fellow? Okay, I think that means friends, okay? And I ask you, loyal friends, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, I, I don't know why he had to go there, but then he's going to give the meat of what we're going to talk about today. That everyone's long of war says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Okay, ironic because where did I say he is right now? Prison. He is chained to someone. 24-7, he has to go to the bathroom with the guard chained to him. That's got to suck. And he's saying, rejoice. It's like, rejoice. I get to go to the bathroom with a guard next to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, rejoice. Rejoice, I say again, which is crazy. He said, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And this is what we want to talk about. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've heard or received, I mean, learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. He's coming in this chapter, and he's saying, rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. But then he starts to talk about something that a lot of people struggle with. We just came out of COVID. We just came, which I officially heard, COVID is completely done. I can't remember. Someone said, Trav, it's now been announced to the world. It's done. It's done. When somebody coughs anymore, you can't say, oh, you have COVID. Okay? It's done. All right? It's done. Um, at least that's what I've been told. Okay? I didn't get the news flash, but somebody told me it, so it must be true. Okay? But we came out of a crazy season. It talks about this idea that we get stressed. We get anxious. We can struggle with anxiety, and the world is looking for one thing. They all want something that Jesus, that um, Paul talks about right here. This idea of this peace of God which transcends all understanding. The world is trying to experience peace. I remember when I was younger, there used to be like the Miss U.S. 
you miss USA pageants. I don't even know if I see them anymore, but probably because I don't go on to channel eight or 10 anymore. So I probably didn't even know there were anymore, but maybe there are, but it's weird. They always said, you know, what do you wish for? What do you wish it happen? You know, I don't, they'd ask this question. They'd always go, I pray for world peace. You know, everyone was almost like, if you didn't say that, you were not going to win the award. Okay. Even if you're the most beautiful person, if you didn't say, you know, I pray for world peace. Because here's the thing is, everybody wants peace. They want peace in this world that people get along. But you know what people are longing for the most? This idea of inner peace. And Paul is saying, the only way you can get it is through God. Let me talk to you a little about this experiencing God's peace. Is Here's you to understand is if you are longing for this, it says this peace is a result of a relationship with God, a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's where it starts is this idea of this relationship. But here's the thing is this peace for us as Christians, we can all get it. We can all get it. We can all have that, that relationship with God. But we don't always experience this pure, perfect peace because we won't fully understand what it means to be perfectly, this perfect peace, really, until we get to heaven. We really won't. But the world is long for something. We're hurting inside. There's anxiety. There's stress. Nothing seems to fit. It doesn't seem to make sense. And the world is longing. I just want peace. You have rich people that are longing for peace, so they're hoping if they just had a little more money, maybe that would buy their peace. You have people that are famous, that like if I was just a little more famous, maybe I would feel complete, there would be peace, and they long for this, but they never get it. When when Paul says, you can only get it through God. You can only get it through Him. So I want to help you understand one thing. I want to let you know something because we live in a world that's stressful. And if you, I have so many students lately that I'm struggling with anxiety. You hear that a lot. It's almost like it's not a new thing, but it's crazy how anxiety, stress, um, this, this inner conflict, I hear it more and more and more from students. I am hearing from high schoolers or young college students that everyone has a nervous breakdown, which that's, that's not true, but it's almost like they feel like that's just normal. And it's crazy how we're going to struggle with these. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it is. I don't know if it's because of the internet. I don't know what's going on. But we're more and more and more stressed out. And here's the sad part is, I'll be honest with you, as you get older, it's not going to change. And I want you to understand something is, Even if I live in a world, understand, it's on your sheet. Even if I live in a world full of stressful situations, I can still experience God's peace. Even if you live in a crazy time, even if you're going through some crazy stuff, even if you're stressed out, I want you to understand something. You can still experience God's peace. And so what I want to do real quick, and I'll try to be brief, is I want to talk about how to experience this God's peace, the one that that Paul says, surpasses all understanding, okay? This perfect peace that, can, that, that is something that people want, but they can't fully obtain it. I want to talk about how to start experience this, experiencing this and not get stressed out. And you might find out it's easier than you think, okay? So if you have your note sheets, pull them out. First thing is this. If you want to experience God's peace and not stress out, here's four things to do. One is this. It's very simple. Make a commitment to not worry about anything. Make a commitment to not worry about anything. Oh, by the way, all four of these things come out of what Paul just said is the way that you can get God's peace. Make a commitment to not worry about anything. It says right here in Philippians 4, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything. Make a commitment to not worry about anything. Okay, let me tell you something. I struggle with stress. I get stressed out a lot. And when someone says that to me, I go, are you an idiot? I tell myself, trap, this doesn't make sense. Don't worry about anything. Make a commitment. To, that's what I am worrying about. Are you an idiot? And, and Paul says, but don't be anxious about anything. It's like, Paul, you don't make any sense. But I love it. I didn't say don't worry any, about anything. I said make a commitment to not worry about it. Make a commitment to right now that you're going to try not to worry about anything. You see, here, here's what you need to understand. I struggle with this, but I want you to know anxiety is going to come in your life, and it's actually 
a natural thing. Because your body, when you stress out, when you get anxious, it's actually your body is preparing you for something. But the problem is, anxiety and stress is not supposed to control you. And it's funny how we do that. Let me show you why Jesus says you should not stress about anything or worry about anything. One is this. He says, if you want to put this underneath there, worry is unreasonable. Worry exaggerates the problem. It never makes it smaller. It only makes it bigger. Have you ever thought about that? When you're stressing about something, it can be the smallest, stupidest thing. That's me. Oh, God. I forgot to bu- book the buses for Magic Mountain. And it's in a month. And what if I call them tomorrow and they say, sorry, they're all booked up. So then I stress all night. It doesn't do anything. It's not like all of a sudden the guy woke up experiencing my stress and was like, I bet you Trav was going to call me. And Trav was going to ask me to book his bus for Magic Mountain. So let me do that. No, nothing. It's funny how, if anything, it gets bigger. And you know what's funny is I call the next morning. He's like, yeah, heck yeah, Trav. Actually, by the way, I forgot to tell you, um, I can give you a better deal than last time. No way. But it's funny how me stressing all night did nothing, but I didn't sleep. It's funny how it doesn't do anything, um, but, but it, it's crazy how that works. Okay? It's not going to change anything, but I think it does. Second thing is this, worry is unnatural. Jesus wants you to understand worry is not natural. Did you know only human beings worry? And here's even crazier, we're not even born with it. It's not like we were born to worry. We actually learn it. We learn it from our environment. That's, we weren't designed by this, by it. Um, Jesus talks about it in Matthew. Like, why do you worry? The birds don't worry. The plants don't worry. No other thing else in creation worries about anything, but we worry. And he said it's a waste of time. Third, it's worries unhelpful. And last one, worries unnecessary. Worry is unnecessary. And so in 1 Peter 5, 7, if you, if, I think it's up there, it says, cast all your worries on God. Cast all your anxieties on because he cares for you. That's what we should be doing. Okay, so first thing is this. If you want to start experiencing God's love, you first have to make a commitment. I'm saying you have to not forget about a thing, not, but you need to make a commitment. You're going to try not. You're going to try not to worry about anything. But this is where some of the steps that Paul talks about that's going to actually help you experience God's perfect peace. Second thing is this, is talk to God about everything. It says, but in everything, by prayer and petition, petition with Thanksgiving, present your request to God. We need to talk to God about everything. Have you guys ever done that before? When we're stressed out, do we talk to him? He says, talk to God about everything. If that is true, talk to God about everything, then that means that even when we're going through good times and bad times, we should be talking to God. You know what's interesting? Your friends, when you have a good day, I'm sure some of you call your friends immediately be like, no way, I just won the Iwata Olympics this weekend. And my friend was like, heck yeah, Trev, I love you. No, that's not true. That's probably not what happened. But it's funny how when something good happens, we can't wait to tell our friends, right? In fact, kind of, we kind of want to brag about things. But your friends being your friends, they're like, yeah, good for you. I'm glad you're, I'm your friend, you know, or they listen, and then guess what? They brag about the things that they did. It's weird how we love that, and then it's crazy. If we're going through a really bad time, we immediately call our friends, and we kind of dump on them all of our, our, our worries, all of our stresses, but that's what they're there for. It's weird how we go to our friends for stuff like that, but why don't we go to God? I want to encourage you, if you want to experience God's perfect peace and you want to not stress out, you need to go to God, talk to him about everything. But when we think about prayer, we think about prayer as, well, I have to pray to him. I have to. I have to, you know what? Some of you probably were on salt and you were told you have to read your Bible, a chapter a day in the Bible and you better pray once a day. And it's funny, it should be the first. We should want to talk to God about everything. Can I just be honest with you? I struggle with anxiety. I struggle with stress. I woke up at 1 a.m. last night. 1 a.m., stress about something stupid. I can't even remember what it is. And I'm stressed. 
And the first thing I started doing is now it led to me and God talking for about 45 minutes. I think I fell asleep 45 minutes later talking to God. Like we need to talk to God about everything. When I'm stressed out, when I'm having a bad day, when things are going good, when I'm stuck in traffic. Oh, yeah, I, I talk to him a lot when I'm in traffic, guys. Um, it's funny. I'll be driving, I'll be stuck in traffic, and then me and God just start talking. And I feel bad for the people driving next to me because they might look in there, and I might be, like, yelling, and I'm not listening to music, and tears are coming down my face because me and God were talking. But do you talk about God about everything? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't pray a lot. I don't pray very much at all. But I talk with God a lot. Me and him talk all the time. But I'm not the big prayer. I'm not the big prayer warrior. But me and God, oh my goodness, we talk all the time. What if that's really what prayer is? What if my whole life I've been told, Trav, do you pray? And I'm like, no, sometimes. But me and God talk. That's what it is. If you want to experience God's perfect peace, when I start talking to God and we start having this relationship, that's when this peace happens. And there's a peace where, like I said, then sometimes I'm stressed and God and I start talking and then I fall asleep. Because it's just me and him just talking. Third thing is this, thank God in all things. Because it says, um, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Thank God in all things. I want you to know something. Do you ever thank God? I remember when I was younger, I would ask God for me to get an A on a test because I forgot to study. And I'm like, God, I didn't study well enough. And all of a sudden, I'd get an A, but I never said thank you. I would pray to God that my friend would invite me to Disneyland. One time, my friend invited me to Disneyland. I was praying, please. And, and he invited me. Didn't thank God. I prayed that I would win some competition like the Juan Olympics. Didn't thank God. Thank my parents, okay? Thank my friends. Didn't thank God. And you know what's funny is my life changed when I started thanking God. Have you ever thanked God for things? And it would start with the good things. God thinks that I had an incredible breakfast this morning. Man, those eggs were amazing. Thank you, God. I know it sounds stupid simple. God, thank you. I started remembering things where it's crazy. I'm trying to remember. There was just an event we did like a week or two ago, and I left and said, God, thanks for that going smooth. I was worried that wasn't going to go smooth. Thank you so much. It went smooth. Have you ever thanked God? But here's the thing is, have you thanked him for the hard times too? Because when I start looking back in my life, do you know when God had the most impact and the most life-changing stuff in my life? It was the hard times. It was when God took me out of a comfortable situation and sent me into a crazy situation where I was stressed, I was crying, I was worried for my life, and then the amount of growth that came out of that, I now look back and go, God, thank you for that. And I can give you four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, twenty, thirty 10, 20, 30 different stories in my life where they sucked in the moment, but looking back, they were the most incredible thing. I needed it. So guess what? When I go through hard times, I now say, God, thank you for that too. When I'm stuck in traffic, I used to get really frustrated. But there have been times that I've tried to take a step back and go, all right, God, this doesn't make sense, but maybe you're protecting me for something. So I guess thank you that I'm even stuck in traffic. Because maybe if I wasn't, maybe I was supposed to get in an accident later. But imagine if we started thanking God. I think that would start changing us. And slowly, I've had students say, Trav, thanks for reminding that. Because when I started thanking God, I started realizing the things that God does in my life. And there's starting to be this peace that comes about as we're experiencing God, a relationship with God. And last thing is this. Actually, you know, let me share a story real quick that's crazy. It's a little intense. But there's this story that a guy told me about this girl named Betsy. She lived through the Holocaust. She was a Jew that was stuck in concentration camps. And if you know anything, especially toward the end, they were just killing Jews like left and right. If you were in a concentration camp, they, they starved you. They did everything, but eventually they killed you. And she was at a concentration camp, one of the worst ones where I think almost everyone died at that concentration camp. 
but she has this story where her cabin was infested with fleas. And it was infested with fleas so bad that it was miserable. She got bit all the time. It was crazy. It was crazy. But because it was infested with fleas, the guards never messed with that cabin, and they never went in there. And she survived the Holocaust because of fleas. And so when she was sharing her story, she says that she thanks God all the time for fleas. For fleas. Is that crazy that we don't always think that sometimes the hardest things we go through, God might be saying, but you don't understand what I'm really doing. I don't know. But have you thought about that? Because maybe we should be thanking God more. Because we don't see what's happening. Last thing is this. Think about good things. Paul ends. The last thing he says, think about these things. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admir admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. You know what? We need to think about good things. It's weird how your brain has control of your body. It's here weird how when I'm stressing out, I think of the negatives, not the positives. I forget what God is doing, what God is teaching, and I forget about that. We need to think about good things. That's what Paul talks about. Concentrate on the good things, but we let the bad things in. Listen, you are going to stress out. There's going to be times when you stress out, but the world is looking for this peace, this perfect peace that can only come from God. God. It really can. And the only way you're fully going to experience is you got to make a commitment right now that you're going to try not to worry about anything. You're going to start talking to God about everything. You're going to thank God in all things. And then you're going to think about good things. Listen, I don't know what's going to go on in the next few years in your life, but I will tell you this. You're going to go through stress. You're going to go through hard times. Don't forget these four things. Look back to Philippians chapter 4. Let me go ahead and pray. Dear God, I just thank you so much for who you are. Lord, I just pray that you would work in these students' lives, continue to, to, to use them. Lord, I just pray for these eighth graders. They leave. Lord, would you protect them in, eighth, in ninth grade? Would you get them connected with, with the 910 ministry? Lord, would they go to camp this summer? Lord, would they get tons and tons of Christian friends here that are going to keep them glued to your word and to you? So, Lord, they'll remember to go to you during these stressful, crazy times and experience your peace. We love you so much in your name. Amen.